for tonight, we're 1 Samuel chapter 23. It's been a while since we've been in 1 Samuel, but we are in chapter 23. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn there to 1 Samuel chapter 23. And uh, since it's been a while because of uh, last week was uh, our Passover service, uh, the week before that was baptisms, the week before that we had Seth Gruber. And so it's been like four weeks since we've been here, but we're going to pick up where we left off. If you're new to our Wednesday night study, we just go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. We are currently in the book of First Samuel. We left off a few weeks ago at chapter 22. So that's where we will pick up. And I'm going to recap chapter 22 so we can get a running start into chapter 23. But let's first have a word of prayer. Father, it is good to be in your house and it is good to draw near to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will use this time as we study your word to speak to our hearts this evening. Thank you, Lord, that you are the well that never runs dry. That we can come to you, Lord, and be filled up and be refreshed. So speak to us tonight, Lord. and refresh our hearts. We just love you and we thank you in Jesus name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. Well, again, to recap and to kind of bring us up to speed, uh, the book of First Samuel now is pretty much devoted to the life of David. He has not yet been crowned king, but he has been anointed king by the prophet Samuel. Samuel anoints young David when David was, it is believed, somewhere between the ages of 10 and 15. Um, I tend to err on the younger side, but you know, somewhere in that age range, he was anointed, but he will not be actually crowned king until he's 30. And so there's going to be this long waiting period between, you know, say 10 years of age until he's 30, like 20 years of waiting. So if you if you feel at times like you've been waiting for something, you know, that you feel like God has promised you, you know, welcome to the Bible club, because there's a lot of people in the Bible that God uh, told things in advance, well in advance. Uh, but yet did not uh, fulfill his promise until years down the road. Sometimes, especially in our modern age where we want everything in an instant and we get frustrated if the McDonald's drive through takes longer than 30 seconds, it is hard for us to actually realize that there are years sometimes that God is working on us before he actually brings something to fruition. And so that's the case with David. David is a young boy when he is anointed by Samuel, but he's not going to be be crowned king until he's 30 years of age. And David's life is divided into these four categories, uh, the shepherding years, the hiding years, the fighting years, and the reigning years. Now, wh where we are right now in 1 Samuel uh, 23 uh, is still part of the hiding years. He's hiding from Saul. Now, Saul's the first king of Israel, but Saul has not yet been replaced. In God's timing, God will replace Saul. God's already made it clear that, that Saul um, has a successor, but God is not through with Saul yet because he's still preparing David. And part of God's preparation for David will be to learn to trust the Lord in difficult years. And he will be hiding from Saul because Saul becomes jealous. Saul, Saul sees the popularity that David gains, especially after God uses David to slay Goliath. The whole nation of Israel sees David as the hero and not Saul. Saul's a very insecure man. Saul is a very envious man. He's a disobedient man, too, to God because he didn't follow God's prescription for, for all things. And so uh, he is, Saul, constantly pursuing David to kill him him because he sees David as a threat to his reign as king and, and Saul is trying to hold on to his reign even though God has already told him you're going to be replaced like you know deal with it because of your disobedience. Saul is doing everything he can to hold on to his reign and what uh, waning popularity he still has and so he is literally because he's demonized at this point he is tormented by demons he's literally trying to kill David and David is on the run really literally for his life and so David will spend anywhere from 10 to 15 years on the run from Saul as Saul pursues him. Now, not just alone, by the way, Saul pursues him with an army that he has. In fact, uh, into chapter 23, we'll see, or into chapter 24, Saul's got 3,000 soldiers with him trying to pursue David to kill him. So um, he is bent on David's death and uh, he's not going to stop short of it, but God is going to continue to protect David. But let me tell you what God's going to do in David's life while David is on the run, hiding from Saul. 
uh, God is going to refine David and God is going to prepare David and God is going to weed out some things in David's life that God is dealing with. And so a lot of times in those uncomfortable years of our lives, it is often while we're waiting on the Lord and, you know, we're, we're frustrated or we're like wondering what's God up to and why hasn't he answered this prayer and why hasn't he done this and why hasn't he done that? He's often refining us and he's purging things from our lives that he wants to deal with. And so he was, he was taking David from a shepherd in the field and preparing him to be king of a nation. Well, there, there's, a, there's a big gap between being a shepherd of a few sheep in the field and being king of a nation. And so God is doing some refining things in David's life. So part of these years, while David is on the run, where we left off a few weeks ago in chapter 22, I'm gonna just throw a map up on the screen for you so we can kind of orient ourselves. This is kind of a snapshot of central Israel, central and slightly su southern part of Israel. And in chapter 22, we find that David, part of hiding from King Saul, is in Adyalam, a cave in Adyalam, which is right there in the, about the middle of the screen. And the Bible says in chapter 22 that because he knows that he's being pursued by Saul and Saul's trying to kill him, that David has a concern for his own family. And so he wants to put, literally wants to put his parents in the witness protection program. And so he actually, chapter 22 tells us that he goes down to the eastern side of the Dead Sea into Moab to a city called Mizpah. And that's where he takes his mother and his father. And he asks the king of Moab, now, you know, the Moabites are enemies of the Israelites, but they're not aggressive towards the Israelites, at least not right now. And remember, why would David think about taking his parents all the way over here to Moab? The answer is because David has Moabite blood in his veins. David's great grandmother was Ruth, and Ruth was a Moabitess. And so perhaps there's some connection there where David realizes, hey, you know, my great grandmother, uh, she was from Moab. This will be a good hiding place for my parents. And so he takes his father and mother, speaks to the king of Moab. Can you please protect my parents for a while? And he leaves them in Mizpah. And then the Bible says in chapter 22 that the prophet Gad tells David, you need to not go back to the cave of Adullam, but stay in the wilderness of Judah. So when David drops his parents off, at Mizpah, he goes up now to the forest of Hereth. And that's where he is when we get here to uh, chapter 23. And Saul is up north in Gibeah. So King Saul is in Gibeah. Now, the tragic thing in chapter 22, which is what we ended up a few weeks ago, uh, tells us that uh, Saul um, believes that Ahimelech, the priest of Israel at that time, was a traitor. Because, again, this is all part of Saul's paranoia and his insecurity. Ahimelech gave David bread and gave David a weapon, happened to be Goliath's sword. And Ahimelech was a friend and is a friend of David. And um, Saul sees that as disloyalty. So he calls Ahimelech and all the priests of Israel, 85 total, to Gibeah up in the north. And Saul begins to question them about their loyalty. Are you really loyal to me or are you loyal to David? And Ahimelech doesn't know any different. He doesn't know that, you know, why should Saul be so insecure? After all, David is Saul's son-in-law too. David married Saul's daughter, Michal. And so uh, Ahimelech is just like, yeah, I gave David shelter. I gave him bread. I gave him a sword. What's the big deal? And Saul's like, well, the big deal is, you know, he's, he's my arch enemy right now. And so he orders, Saul orders his men to kill Ahimelech, the priest, and all the priests. And in an act of civil disobedience, again, there are examples in the Bible where civil disobedience is acceptable when you are wanting to obey the higher law of God rather than a, a man's authority if man's authority contradicts the higher law of God. And, and Saul's men said, we're not going to kill the priest and we're not going to kill the, the, his, his priests with him. And so one young man in the crowd, Doeg, steps up. He's an Edomite and Doeg says, I'll kill him because he wants to ingratiate himself with King Saul. And so Doeg kills on behalf of King Saul, the 85 priests of Israel, slaughters them in chapter 22. 
Now one of the sons of Ahimelech, his name is Abiathar, escapes the slaughter, makes his way to David and tells David what happened. And David says, stay with me and I'll take care of you. That's the way chapter 22 ends. So there is still one priest left in the priestly order. His name again is Abiathar and David is gonna protect him. So that brings us up here to chapter 23. So verse one says, and then they told David saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. All right, now pause for a moment. We're gonna move on the map a little further uh, south to uh, Keilah. There, there it is on the map. And the question is, why is David having to defend this Jewish town? Isn't that the responsibility of the king of Israel, which is Saul? And the answer is, yeah, it should have been Saul defending the people of Keilah against the Philistines who had attacked them. But Saul is too busy chasing David. So he's not taking care of the nation. And so David inquires of the Lord, should I go do it, Lord? And the Lord says, yes, go do it. Now, I want you to notice in this series of verses we're about to read here in the opening part of chapter 23, that there are three different times that David inquires of the Lord and he gets answers from the Lord. And how does he get these answers? Well, what we find out in a few more verses is that Abiathar, this low, uh, lone surviving priest, has an ephod with him. Now, an ephod was a garment that the priest would wear. And in the vestment of the ephod, the priest would keep two stones. Actually, some say a third stone, which was a neutral stone. One stone was called an urim. Another stone was called the thumum. And one stone meant yes, one stone meant no, and a third stone was just no answer from God. And this is how they would discern the will of the Lord back in the day where you would consult the priest and you could only ask a yes or no question. And so it would be, in this case, should I go and defend the people of Keilah? And the Lord says, yes. So what is inferred, and we'll see it here in a little bit, I'm, I'm just kind of giving you a preview. What's inferred is that Abiathar reaches within the vestment, pulls out the stone that is yes. Now sometimes, again, it would be a stone that says no, and sometimes it would be this third stone, which would just be blank, meaning God's not answering. And so you just wait until you get an answer. But David is told by the Lord, yeah, go, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. And verse three says, but David's men said to him, look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And then David inquired of the Lord once again. So this is the second time. Now, by the way, it tells us back in chapter 22 that David's got a ragtag group of army guys with him, 400 in number. They're going to grow to 600 here in a moment. And these guys are, they're, they're literally from the island of misfits because it says that these guys are the discouraged, the disadvantaged. These are the guys that, that are in debt, but they rally around David and David is going to use them and groom them into a mighty army. But these guys at first are like, you know what? There's only like 400 of us. We can't really fight the Philistines. So David inquires again. He's like, yeah, you got a point there. We might be outnumbered. Let's see what the Lord says. Well, and the Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Verse five, and David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So again, he's the national hero. Saul's asleep on the job, but, you know, and, but, here, but here's David fighting for the nation. It says in verse, uh, verse 6, And now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, this is the priest, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. So this is where it fills in the gap for us. It tells us Abiathar has this priestly vestment, so we had the Urim and the Thummim to be able to answer the yes or no questions from God opposed to God. Verse 7, and Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So now Saul gets intel that David's in Keilah. And so Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And when David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, 
He said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. And then David said, O Lord, God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. So again, this is, this is the third inquiry that David is making of God. It's again a yes or no question. Is he going to come down? And will the men of Keilah turn me over to him? And again, they're using the Urim and the Thummim. But you can make a notation in the margin of your Bible. This is the last time that the Urim and Thummim is used in the Old Testament. And the rest of the Bible, for that matter. At this point, at the end, Abiathar is the last one to use the Urim and the Thummim. And now the way that they get revelation from God is not from these stones pulled out of the vestment of the priest, but it is through the revelation through the prophets. And so no longer will they rely on this. But he's inquiring of the Lord. Now look what the Lord says. Verse 9, when David knew that Saul, uh, oh, no, so he pre asked and prayed, uh, tell your servant. And the Lord said, verse 11, he will come down. And then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. And so David and his men, about 600, so now it's grown from 400 to 600, they arose and, de and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. And then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. Now, um, something important to, to note with me here. Three times uh, David seeks the Lord here because he's trying to discern the Lord's will. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? So what we've been talking about principles from each of these chapters. So here's a principle from chapter 23. When in doubt, seek God out, right? I mean, it's obvious because usually when we are in a difficult situation, that's what drives us to pray. So nobody usually has to tell you when you're in a difficult spot, you should probably pray because that's the first thing that we tend to do after we get through Googling and worrying about it. Then, then we'll usually, you know, be driven to prayer because we're in a difficult spot. But this is what David does here. Notice he is given different counsel by his men, his army that he's pulled together, they tell him we shouldn't go to Keilah because the Philistines outnumber us. And what does David do? He hears what they say, but he inquires of the Lord and the Lord says otherwise. So it's always good, you know, it's fine, get counsel. Like the Bible says there's safety in the multitude of counselors, but the ultimate counselor we need to hear from is the Lord. And, and that's why we need to know the Bible. That's why we need to have an ear that is inclined to the Lord. Because Proverbs 19.21 says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. And so David under, understood here that, you know, people are going to tell him one thing, but what does God say about the matter? And what's unfortunate in this scene here is that God tells him, yes, Saul's coming, and also, by the way, the men of Keilah are going to give you up. Isn't that, isn't that sad? He's just rescued this town, Keilah, against the Philistines. And God says, but if Saul shows up here, these men will turn you over. You talk about betrayal. Betrayal. These guys who have just been rescued by David are willing to give him up to King Saul. And so David and his men move on. And when Saul hears about that, he says, oh, well, I'm not going to keep hunting him all over the countryside. So he, uh, he halted the expedition. Keep reading with me, verse 14. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. So let's go back to our map. And you can see there the wilderness of Ziph right in the middle of the map. Um, we're, we're talking the western side of the, of the Dead Sea. By the way, everything on the eastern side of the Dead Sea on the map today would be the country of Jordan, like Moab is, is in Jordan. And so this is where David is now in the wilderness of Ziph. And it says, Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. And so David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. 
Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. Underline that. Strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, this is Jonathan speaking to David. Now remember, they had a very unique, um, sincere friendship. Jonathan was anywhere from 10 to 30, uh, sorry, 20 to 30 years older than David. So there was even a generational difference here, but they were the best of friends. There was nothing weird going on here. I've already covered that in previous chapters, but they have the kind of loyal friendship that is very rare and was very unique. And Jonathan says to David, do not fear. This is verse 17. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you you. Even my father Saul knows that. And so the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed in the woods and Jonathan went to his own house. Now note that it says that they made a covenant. Actually, back in chapter 18, verse 3, they made a covenant. In chapter 20, verse 16, they renewed a co the covenant. And so this is actually a renewal of the renewal. In other words, they just had a bond and a loyalty. And they uh, had this bond before God that they were going to, you know, uh, serve the Lord and, um, and honor him. And this is remarkable because Jonathan is basically more loyal to David than he is to his own father because he sees the hand of God on David's life and he sees that his father has just gone mad. I mean, literally, his dad is, is uh, paranoid, his dad is um, insecure, his dad is demonized, and he realizes the hand of God is not with my dad. And Jonathan selfishly could have wanted the throne because he was technically next in line, but he acknowledged that God's calling was upon David and that God had selected David. And so Jonathan was loyal loyal to him. And I love the way it says here that he, you know, he finds David here hiding out in, in, in the wilderness of, of Ziph. And it says there, I ask you to underline it if you wanted to, and he strengthened David's hand in God. And he gives them this little short pep talk about do not fear for the hand of Saul, my father shall not find you. And to me, it speaks of another principle from chapter 23. Look for someone to strengthen with the gift of encouragement, because that's what Jonathan did. Jonathan brought a word of encouragement to his best friend, and he, and he just encouraged him. And I think it is important for us to look for people that we can help to strengthen just with a word of encouragement. You would be surprised how much a timely word of encouragement can just mean the world of difference to somebody. And, and I would just really exhort us to consider, you know, being mindful and, and prayerful. Like, Lord, who, who, you know, just think about in any given day or any given week, you know, Lord, who is it that you might want me to just encourage today? Who is it you just might want me to say something to that would just be a word of encouragement to them? Um, by the way, that will go a long way to relieving your own discouragement. You know, when you might feel down or you might feel discouraged or you might be even hearing me say this and think to yourself, well, I want somebody to encourage me. Well, you know what? Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, Snowflake. And you might just have to actually, sorry to melt you, but you might just have to actually think to yourself, you know what will be good for my situation is if I look for somebody that I can encourage. You will be surprised how you'll get out of your own despair when you look for someone who's in despair that you might encourage them and how God will will bless you and encourage you because you're looking out for somebody else. When we sit around and say, you know, woe is me and I wish somebody would meet my needs, meet my needs, you're not, you're not focused on anybody else around you except yourself, but you'll be surprised at how God will meet your needs when you look towards someone else and how you can encourage them and how you can uh, speak into their lives that would be something that is helpful and, and something that ministers to them. So, you know, look for other people and let God use you to encourage someone who needs it. And you'll be surprised how God will encourage yourself in the process. And so this is what Jonathan does. Now, sad note at this part. This is the last time that David and Jonathan will see each other. Jonathan's going to die in war. 
And so this is the last encounter that they have face to face. It says in verse 19, then the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah. Again, he's back up there at the top of the map. He's in Gibeah. And um, they turn David in too. They came up to Saul at Gibeah saying, is David not hiding with us in the strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hakila, which is in the south of Jezimon. Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. I mean, this guy can't get a break, David. He's like, everybody's betraying him. Everybody's calling him out. Everybody's giving up intel on him. And so he has to keep running. Verse 21, and Saul said, blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure and see the place where, you, where his hideout is and who has seen him there, for I am told he is very crafty. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with certainty and I will go with you. And it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. And so they arose and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon. So back on the map, he's going further south, down now to the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jezimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, therefore, he went down to the rock. Now notice that and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. It, it's interesting that, you know, here he is in this big wilderness, the wilderness of Maon, and uh, Saul gets wind of it. And so David, it just says, where does he retreat? He went down to the rock. Like, like there's this huge rock somewhere where everybody knows, that, oh yeah, it's just the rock. Like uh, everybody knows where the rock is which is kind of like a dead giveaway. If you, if you want to hide from Saul, why are you going to the rock? But here's what I want you to note with me, and, and I've done this as we've gone through some of these chapters here where David is on the run and David is hiding. Because as I mentioned weeks ago, th these are the places where David writes many of his Psalms. He wrote 75% of the whole book of Psalms. And many of the Psalms that he wrote were while he was on the run in the cave of Adullam, in the wilderness of Judah, down at En Gedi. And one of the Psalms that he wrote is Psalm 18, and he wrote it about the rock. Now I'm gonna turn there, you can turn if you want also, um, or you can just listen. But this is Psalm 18, I'm gonna read the first uh, six verses and then I'm gonna skip to the end of the chapter because it's 50 verses long. But in Psalm 18, the subtitle says this, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Okay, so notice, so we know for sure that Psalm 18 was written while he was running from Saul. And I want you to see the symbolism here in Psalm 18, verse 1. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surround me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. So notice there, he's, he's talking. The idea is here he is hiding from Saul by this known rock in this wilderness here of Maon. And it causes him to realize that this rock is providing for him temporary shelter that he can hide behind, but the ultimate rock that is the source of strength in his life is the Lord his God. And listen to how the chapter ends, Psalm 18, uh, I'll jump to verse 46. 
He reiterates it there in verse 46. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Obviously, the violent man is a reference to Saul, and he's right writing here about how God is his strength, God is his rock, God is his sure foundation. And so it's interesting, again, as Saul, as uh, rather David is on the run and he's in the wilderness and he's living out of caves and he's, he's constantly moving from place to place without a home, that God is speaking to him. And God is drawing him near to himself. God is exercising, if you will, David's spirit, strengthening him, preparing him to be the next king of Israel. But there's much work to be done. You know, David is now in his 20s, but there, there is work to be done here. And so David is drawing near to the Lord and calling him his rock as he's hiding here by the rock in the wilderness of Maon. Back here in, in 1 Samuel 23, continuing in verse 25, it says, And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon, verse 26, and then Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And so David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. And therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. And so they called that place the Rock of Escape. And then David went up from there and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. So he moves further south on our map. He goes now uh, further south down um, to the coast, to the western coast of the Dead Sea. And this is where we find him. Now I'm just going to read because we're almost out of time, so I don't want to get into all of chapter 24, but I want to read just the, the first, um, just the first verse of chapter 24, because I also want to weave in a couple of Psalms that David wrote. So just look at chapter 24, verse one. It says, now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. En Gedi in Hebrew means the spring of the wild goats. The wild goats also called the Ibex. Now, if you were with me in Israel just, what, a month ago or two, um, En Gedi was one of the places that we visited. And here's actually a picture um, that we took on one of our recent uh, trips there. This is the spring of En Gedi. And I want you to imagine a, a wasteland, a vast desert, and you've got this one spring in the middle of the wilderness. It's the spring of En Gedi, the spring of the wild goats. And you can see Ibex, you can see little wild goats running all alongside the, you know, the, the, the mountainside. And they can literally, they're little tiny hooves, they can literally walk on four inch cliffs hugging alongside of the mountains down there. And that's why it's called the Spring of the Wild Goats because they would often um, get water here. And this is the place where David would hide. It was the only source of fresh water. You know, we, we take fresh water for granted, but when you're in the middle of a desert in a wilderness, you gotta hang out somewhere near fresh water. And so David hung out here uh, in, in Gedi, and there are a few different Psalms that he would write. And so we'll, we'll close our Bible study for tonight by looking at two of these Psalms. If you, if you just leave 1 Samuel and go to Psalm 57, we're going to look at Psalm 57 and 63. So Psalm 57. So again, put yourself in, in David's sandals here and just think about how, you know, you're on the run for your life. You're, you're in this oasis in the middle of the desert at, at Gedi. And the Lord is going to speak to you, and you're going to draw near to Him. And one of the Psalms that He writes here is Psalm 57. Now again, if you look at the subtitle in your Bibles, Psalm 57 says, Prayer for Safety from Enemies, and, and it says, To the chief musician set to Do Not Destroy, whatever that tune is, <laughs> a miktam of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. And this is Psalm 57. It's only 11 verses. I'll read all of it. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. 
and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit for me. Into the midst of it they themselves have fallen. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awake in the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Isn't that a beautiful psalm? And he wrote it inspired there in the cave near En Gedi. Go to Psalm 63 and we'll read this one before we go. Psalm 63, also 11 verses. The subtitle is a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. So En Gedi is part of the wilderness of Judah and this is what he writes. And you can see here the, the language you know, th this is why I want you to see the Psalms woven through 1 Samuel, because he's, I want you to see firsthand how he's inspired and moved by his scenery and surroundings as he draw, draws near to the Lord. So, verse 1, he says, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Amen. And we'll pick up the story there into chapter 24 next week, Lord willing. But let's pause there tonight and pray. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the heart of David reflected through the Psalms. And Lord, sometimes we might find ourselves in the wilderness, so to speak. We thank you, Lord, that you meet us there. Your fresh water in a dry and weary land. How our soul thirsts for you, Lord. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that you will meet our needs. Thank you, Father, that you have us in mind. You know us. We thank you that you always have your best for us, Lord. And we wait for your perfect timing. I pray, God, for those who are just waiting on you, that you will show yourself strong to them while they wait, and that during the waiting time, they would draw closer to you. They would learn more about you, Lord. That you would refine us during the waiting years. And you would build us up, Lord. And we just give you the praise and the glory and the thanks. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight. Be with us as we go in our places, home. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said, amen.